Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our presentation today, Building a Portfolio Management Process from the Ground Up. As always, we have a few quick logistics we want to cover before we get started. Uh, we are expecting over 400 uh, attendees today, so we're not going to open the line for questions. However, we do have a webinar facilitator who is on the other end and will monitor the questions via the chat module, um, should you have any throughout the presentation. If she is, for some reason, unable to answer your questions, I'll re be reviewing that panel uh, when the webinar concludes, and I'll follow up with you directly if needed. Uh, you can also feel free to email me. My email address is at the bottom of the screen. That being said, all the lines will be muted throughout the presentation. Um, if for some reason you get pulled away during the webinar, no problem. We will be sending out uh, the recording and the full deck um, following the presentation. And then finally, for those of you who need PDU information, um, we'll be sending that number out uh, with the slide deck and the recording as well. So with that, let's go ahead and get started. As we're well into the new year, um, many of us organizations are realizing the importance of a critical step in the PPM discipline, which is portfolio planning. For the average business, uh, portfolio planning may be a process well beyond their maturity. Um, however, it is a major component uh, that should not be overlooked um, in order to increase the probability of reaching your business objectives. In fact, the structure in which we execute this discipline, um, you know, we expect that to vary across organizations based on their, their discipline and their maturity. However, the basic steps can be followed regardless of the complexity of the processes behind them. So we're going to cover that today. So why define a portfolio? Um, well, organizations will always have projects, they'll always have limited resources, and they'll always need to meet business objectives in order to remain a successful business, right? So if you're not implementing the right projects and the right work to meet those objectives, the value that you're bringing to the business may actually be smaller than its true potential. So for today's agenda, we're going to be covering the following topics. First and foremost, we'll be covering a general overview of portfolio management. What is it and what does it mean for your organization? We're also going to talk about the portfolio management process and the three steps you can take to define your process internally if you don't already have one in place. Um, if you're going to build a PPM process from the ground up, there are several considerations um, to keep in mind, and we're going to go over those as well. Then we'll move on to the 10 essential steps of portfolio management, and then lastly, we'll touch on some of the various tools you can leverage to make uh, your portfolio management process a success internally. So with that, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, once again, uh, project portfolio management is about identifying and selecting the right work uh, to meet your business objectives and, and maximize your business value in return. Effectively identifying, planning, sequencing, and managing the right work initiatives can be cumbersome, as you may know, um, and, and actually formally required uh, heavy analytics tools, complex heavy analytics tools. However, in today's world, um, technology is getting smarter, right? So making simple project portfolio management is, is more of a reality today. The key is to combine what can be a complex discipline, which is project portfolio management, with an intuitive end user interface that makes the, the portfolio planning simple. And we're going to show you how to do that today. You can see from the process laid out on the screen that the PPM process is a continuous cycle in which demand is captured, selected, and then based on key metrics and analytics, planned, executed, and then managed. As new demand comes in, however, the process starts all over again. And, and you know, most of us, when new demand comes in, we raise our hand and say, yep, we'll, we'll get it done. Um, but there's some important steps to, to consider and to execute. Uh, before that work is accepted into the life cycle. In the portfolio management cycle, the following general questions will be asked for every item in your portfolio. Does the project or work initiative align with the organization's strategic objectives and goals? Um, this one's important. If the answer is no, it should not be uh, considered for your uh, execution. 
based on defined key performance indicators and probable risk, does this project or work initiative meet the requirements for portfolio inclusion? So we're going to talk about um, some of those criteria uh, later on in the presentation. And then lastly, where does it rank with other initiatives currently in progress? And that goes back to what I just mentioned. Um, we can't just accept all work. Uh, when new demand comes in, we need to analyze it against uh, what's currently going on uh, to make the proper decision whether we should move forward. Let's talk about the process for the process. Many organizations actually don't have a portfolio management process. In order to create a process where no process exists, um, the right steps must be taken. Um, as you can see on the screen, step one, define a portfolio management organization structure. So how do we do this? Well, this step is probably the most critical simply because if you fail to define all of your stakeholders and all of those involved, it could lead to rework uh, later and even missed requirements. So to ensure all stakeholders are considered, ask yourself the following questions. There's actually three slides of questions, so I'm going to put up each one of them individually um, because there are a lot of areas to consider, and then you guys will have this information um, when we deliver the, the slide deck. The first one, who will decide what work makes it into your portfolio? Who will define the governance framework? Who will be making the decisions regarding portfolio performance, alignment, resourcing, and changing? Who will be responsible for project execution? Who will provide business case information? Who will define the project execution process? Who will manage the resources? Who will actually do the work and execute on that work? Uh, if applicable, applicable, who will be responsible for competitive analysis? Who will handle management of business operations? Who will manage the infrastructure? Who will handle legal implications? Who will manage the finances? Who will benefit from the product or project? And then, of course, finally, what third-party vendors will be involved. Again, very important to make sure that you've identified all the stakeholders. So go through those questions in detail and make sure that everybody that's involved in the answers are included in the portfolio management uh, process. So now that you know what stakeholders to involve, let's move on to step two, define a portfolio management plan, very similar to the project management plan that we're all familiar with, not a schedule, but the actual plan itself. The following questions need to be addressed in your portfolio management plan. What are the roles and responsibilities of the stakeholders? How will communication be handled throughout the process? What is the process for creating portfolio items? How will PIs be selected and approved? And by PIs, I mean portfolio items. And what metrics will be used to determine success? Now that we understand the portfolio management plan, let's move on to the third and final step of the process, defining your key evaluation metrics. Uh, as we're, uh, we're still passing through this difficult economy, um, I think we're all finding that it's more critical than ever to ensure the right investments are being made. The key evaluation metrics that you define for your portfolio items are critical um, in determining the resulting project or work value. So what are you getting out of the work initiatives that you're executing on? Um, I'm going to skim through a few of these metrics um, that may be considered when determining which projects and which work uh, would bring the most value to your uh, business. For example, will the project or work generate new revenue? Will the end result provide cost savings in the future? Will it help you expand into new markets maybe? Will it reduce time to market or cycle times of future work? Customer satisfaction is also a critical consideration, so will it help with retention in the future, possibly? If knowing the answer to these questions that you see on the screen is critical and would help you determine whether or not you will approve portfolio items moving forward, then you should consider developing key metrics on this criteria for your evaluation process. There, there are no right or wrong metrics in determining which projects and work bring the most value to your organization. But there's no reason to reinvent the wheel either. So leverage best practices and internal governance already in place to make this complex task a little bit more feasible as you go through the process. Leverage a portfolio management decisioning tool such as EPM Live. We'll talk about that later. 
that supports your current processes as that is uh, flexible enough and is also flexible enough to, to customize and fit your specific business needs. Once you have a process down for defining, selecting, and executing your portfolio, you're ready for the essential steps to portfolio management. Before we get into the actual steps, though, we need to make sure that, we, uh, that the following assumptions that you see on the screen are true. The organization's executive management is on board with the portfolio management plan. This is critical. You won't get very far if they're not. Uh, all proposed projects and work efforts will be evaluated for inclusion into the portfolio. In order to have a complete portfolio and visibility into all of your investments, you need to make sure that all projects and work are considered in this process. The appropriate skilled staff is available to manage the portfolio. Um, all portfolio management processes have been defined. Those are the processes we just talked about. And then lastly, a standard tool across the organization is being used for portfolio management planning. There are many published standards and white papers for achieving portfolio management within your organization, as you can probably imagine. Um, for the purposes of the webinar, though, we'll be defining 10 of the most essential steps based on EPM Wives implementation experience over the last 13 years. More mature organiza organizations may introduce additional steps, um, so be aware of that, and that's fine as well. Um, with that, let's go ahead and kick it off. So step one, identify portfolio items. Determine what project or work you would like to implement. Uh, this is not an individual effort. Um, most likely work and projects will be identified by many in the organization. Step two, define portfolio items. For this pre-selection round, you'll, you'll need to define enough information to establish value of the given in initiative, uh, but not too much detail. Description, business case, benefits, strategic alignment, uh, and risk tolerance are all factors to be considered for this step. Keep in mind, though, that some of the key evaluation metrics that we discussed um, on the previous slide you know, may apply to your organization, may not. So this is, this is going to be a, a step that is individual to your business, right? So what, what criteria do you need to, to see to determine what's moving forward and what's not? Step three, evaluate portfolio items. Once all your items are entered into the portfolio, it's time to evaluate them. This can be done through a variety of methods. For example, you may leverage a, a formula for rating your items against each other, determine which item will bring the most value the least amount of risk, uh, align best with your resources, or even provide the best alignment with your organization's objectives. Rating and scoring is a common portfolio management practice uh, for portfolio selection. We'll show you some of that a little bit later. You may also introduce what-if modeling to view various models and conditions should you approve a given portfolio. Step four, select your portfolio. Based on the evaluation criteria, you'll be you will determine which items bring the most value to your organization. You'll, you'll keep hearing me say that over and over again because we want to make sure that the end result is maximized value. Once your key portfolio items have been selected, you'll be entering one last evaluation stage prior to approving your portfolio. And that is going to be um, the reassessed portfolio stage. Based on the evaluation criteria, you'll, you'll determine which items meet, bring the most value to your organization. Um, excuse me, in the last step. In this stage, it's common for more detailed information to be added to the portfolio work items, right? So this stage allows the portfolio team to reevaluate the items based on additional information such as uh, maybe a high-level cost plan and uh, a resource plan. So you're going to do a little bit more um, planning in this area so that when you're assessing it again, uh, you'll have more information uh, to compare with each item to make the, the most informed decisions. And then step six is approve the portfolio. Once the portfolio selection team has had time to reassess the portfolio based on further portfolio information, as discussed in the last step, um, the, appro the approval process can begin. Um, the approved items then go into an uh, execution stage and are typically handed off to the project team for execution. Again, that may vary across organizations. Step seven, transition portfolio items um, to a project or work initiative. Um, the approved items are then promoted to actual projects or work and are moved to the execution phase. At this point, a, a project manager will typically uh, be assigned if one hasn't already been assigned already. Step eight, 
portfolio communication, performance tracking, and reporting. Um, portfolio management does not end, of course, with the selection approval. It is now time to track the performance of your portfolio. KPIs will be used to visualize the status and uh, track progress. We'll go over some of this in the, the tool section as well. Step nine, um, portfolio change management. At any point in the portfolio management lifecycle, new project requests and portfolio items can be introduced, and I will say they will be introduced, <laughs> most likely. In addition to new requests, um, current approved items and execution can be affected, right, when you're bringing in new work, um, which means unexpected risks or unforeseen environmental factors um, could also lead to project cancellation. The change management step um, will be ongoing throughout the life cycle and is very critical for success. So, you know, your, your executives need to be able to see what implications uh, will occur should you introduce new work into your portfolio. And that kind of goes back to the modeling that we talked about earlier, so we'll show you how to do that as well. And then step 10, begin uh, again at step 1 as new items are introduced start over at step one. So with that, Matt, I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to you so you can demonstrate uh, a few tools that will maybe help our audience with building their own project, uh, project portfolio management process. Sounds good. Thank you, Heather. So the, the goal here will be to try to walk through um, in the tool, in EPM Live, how to, to do all of these things that we just talked about to kind of tie together and, and show you what that would look like within the system. So I believe I'm showing my screen now, and we'll go ahead and get started. So first of all, I'm logged into the, the system here as um, what we would call a project or portfolio manager type of role, depending on your, your business. You may be using you know, different roles or different names for those roles. But you can see here I'm in a community, which is called the Portfolios Community. And within this community, there's information that shows here that you know, makes sense for what I'm trying to do. So for instance, there's things like portfolios, projects, resources, and reports. Very simple, kind of at a, at a high level, you can see how all of those types of things are doing and look into details and enter data and so on and so forth. So we're going to start and jump into some tools here. Um, the very first thing that I'd like to do is just talk about a, a brief concept here in the system. The, the, the difference between portfolios and projects, right? So if I go into the portfolios tab here, we'll have a list of different portfolios and we can get some high level data at the portfolio level so maybe we have four projects or five projects going on um, you know for any one of these particular portfolios here and instead of having to try to you know aggregate all that data together say in an excel report or something um, and pull it all together we can quickly um, through the tool, it's rolling up all the data from the projects that, that are going on for these portfolios, and it's giving me things like quick budget status and schedule health and so on and so forth, and if I switch to my cost view, I can see costs and benefits and, and you know, different things like that. So it's aggregating it, and it's making it really easy for me to see what's going on with my portfolios. But really, in, a, in the normal process, all of the, the work, let's say, is really done at the project level. So that's where we're going to be spending most of our time today. So I'm going to jump down to the project level. <coughs> And we'll go ahead and look at some of the, the portfolio management tools to help you get through those 10 steps. <laughs> so the first tool we'll look at here is the, the resource planner. Um, but before I do that, I'm just going to go ahead and create a, a brand new project here. So this would be how someone would put in a, a proposed portfolio item or propo proposed project into the system. So I'll call this test project now. <clears throat> So when you do this, you choose a portfolio. So this is how it knows to roll that data up to that portfolio. Um, you know, as we start to execute this product and put in budgets and things like that, that'll all roll up to that portfolio automatically because we selected it here. <laughs> I can put in some information about my project. I'm just going to put in the required things here so that we can uh, keep going and see some of the tools. So I'm going to make myself the project manager, and I'm going to make myself the planner. Oops. Steve. And I'll make myself the planner. <clears throat> and then we'll go ahead and give it an estimated start date, and that should be enough for us to get started. Um, some other information here before we look at the resource planner, um, you know, just while we're here, is that you can do some of those prioritization types of things right here, right now, if you're ready, if you know this information, or you can enter this later. 
but basically I can say things like, um, how aligned is this to my corporate business objectives, this particular project? Do I think it's not aligned, moderately, strategically aligned would be the, the most, and I could pick a choice here. I could also say, you know, this is just at a real high level, how much cost reduction do I think I'm going to get from this particular project? And you, you can see I can do maybe 10 to 35 percent, I'm estimating. Is it going to improve employee satisfaction? How risky is it? Um, and this is all configurable, so you can add more criteria here if you'd like, or you can have less criteria. And what it actually does, I'm going to go ahead and save here, is when I save, based on the choices I pick, it calculates a, a weighted score. So by default, all of those different pieces of criteria are weighted at 25%, so they're all weighted equally. Um, and it's going to generate a, a total score for us based on um, that particular, you know, the choices that we pick. So you can see here it gave us what we call a prioritization score of 54. And you can use this score to help make some of those decisions of, you know, more, a little more objectively by looking at all of your projects and, hey, which one has the highest score, which 10 of them have the highest scores, you know, whatever it may be. It's just an extra piece of information that you can objectively and easily look at to use to, to make the decision of whether or not you're going to, you know, actually do this project or not. So that's uh, one tool in helping with this process. Uh, the next one that we'll look at is the resource planner. So we've put in our, you know, our project and we're, we're proposing this. Um, we might have put in some high level information like we saw below. Um, but now, you know, it, it looks interesting. It looks like we might want to do it. Let's go ahead and put a little bit more information in and see how much resources it's really going to take, how much it's going to cost, so on and so forth. So the first step of that, I'll hit edit resource plan here. <coughs> And it's going to open up what we call our, our resource planner. And so this is before the project even gets started. So we're still in the, the planning phase. It hasn't been accepted, but we just want to build it out a little bit more before we go ahead and accept it. <clears throat> so what you can do in here is you can say, what resources do I think I'm going to need, but at a high level? I'm not building out a full schedule uh, of tasks with detailed tasks and so on and so forth. I'm just going to do things like I need this many developers and this many business analysts, and I might assign some named resources. And the way you do that is, um, I'm going to switch my view here in the bottom to show generic resources. When I do that, it's going to show me just all of my generic resources, so things like business analyst, DBA, developer, infrastructure, so on and so forth. Because maybe I don't know right now which actual named resources are going to be working on this particular project. I just know I need two business analysts and a project manager, let's say. So the way I can do that is I can drag and drop my business analyst on top of my project. And then I can also drag and drop my project manager on top of my project. And the way I say I need two or one or whatever it may be, um, you can do that for hours per month. So you can say I need this many hours of you know, business analyst work in each of these months, or you know, I'm, I'm estimating that I do anyway. Or I like better to, to do it in FTEs, so full-time equivalents. So I can just easily say I need one full-time employee or two full-time employees. Or you can do FT percent. Say I need 50% of someone or 75% of or 200%, whatever it may be. I like FT, so I'm going to go ahead and switch to that. So I can type right in here, I'm going to need two business analysts. And maybe I need it for the, the life of the project. So there's a cool tool here, Allocate Values. I'll hit that. I'm going to put two in here, and I'm going to copy these values all the way across so I don't have to type them in over and over again here. From there, for instance, in August, I only needed it one, actually. I could go back and make that change if I wanted to. Um, and then project managers, let's say we only need one, so I'll just allocate one across the life of that particular project. <coughs> um, and, and that could be it. This could be your resource plan. Um, or you could take it one step further, and instead of just saying, I need this many resources, let's see if we actually have the resources to do this. So the way you would do that was then I could click on my business analyst role here and there's a button called Match. I'll click on Match, and it's going to look through my resource pool, and it's going to give me a percent match, uh, basically a, a score of, of how good they you know, meet the requirements for this particular uh, you know, resource requirement. And it does that based on a few things. It looks at the, the department and the role. So I'm looking for someone in the service department and who has the business analyst role. So it's going to put all of those people first. But it also looks at how available the people are. So over here, these numbers that we're looking at are how much remaining availability these people have in these particular time periods. So I can see here, if I scroll down, Jackie Chen in April is already over allocated. So it shows up red, which makes it really easy to catch that. So hopefully, while you're building these plans, you don't use anyone that has red in the time period. 
Um, that way you're not you know, over allocating people, but you want to get them as, as close to allocated as possible. But I can very easily see here, it gives me a percent match that the highest is Scott Bishop. So I want to use Scott Bishop. I'm going to go ahead and drag and drop Scott Bishop on top of the business analyst role. And when I do that, it asks me a question. It's very intuitive. It asks me, do I want to fulfill or do I want to replace this business analyst? Since I'm actually looking for two business analysts, I don't want to just replace. If I just replace, it's going to give Scott Bishop the, the work of two people, basically, and that's going to you know, over-allocate him by 100%. <clears throat> so instead, I'm going to say fulfill, and then from there, I can do some more work. So I'll say fulfill. And what that does is instead of just replacing it, it puts Scott Bishop under the business analyst role. It does give him all of the work right now, which you can see did make him over-allocated. You can see now he's negative one because he's working, you know, two, you know, basically the work of two people within one month. And you can see here that the original requirement was two and that there's zero remaining. So we did fulfill the requirement, but we over-allocated them. So that's not good. We need to fix that. So we can look down here and we can say, well, Brian Cox is mostly available in these months, so we could take Brian Cox now, um, and he's also the right department role. We can drag and drop him onto Scott Bishop instead of onto the business analyst. And when I do that, it, it realizes what I'm trying to do, and it says, do you want to split the work between these two people, or do you want to replace him? And I want to split it, because I want to resolve some of this over allocation. So I'll go ahead and split. Now you can see that Scott's doing one FTEs of the work, Brian's doing the other. Um, it did over-allocate Brian, and from here I could, you know, split the work of Brian with someone else if I needed to. I'm just going to go ahead and leave it like this. But you can see how you can very easily build out this plan. Um, now I can go look for my project manager. I just click on that, hit match, and do the same thing. So I have a project manager here. I'll drag and drop that onto my role, and I'm going to go ahead and say fulfill, and I'll just leave that one. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> so... Um, there can be more of a process here. You can have a whole approval process of these resource plans, what we call full negotiation. And the way that works, uh, if, if you're interested, when I hit save, it's basically going to ask me, do I want to mark these rows as private? Or, or I'm sorry, keep them private or mark them as public? If I say yes to make them public, and resource negotiations are turned on, it's going to send a notification to the resource manager of all of these resources and say, hey, come in and approve it. And the way that would look is they would come into this tool very similarly, except from a, a slightly different area. Um, but they'd basically come and select this row, um, and then they could accept or reject uh, these particular assignments. Um, and I'm actually the resource manager of a few of these resources, not all of them, so the accept button will let me accept it right here. So they would just come in and accept, or they would reject, and that would send a notification back to the project manager, and they would have to find out something. The resource manager could drag a, another person on there and say, hey, I'm proposing this person instead of that person for whatever reason. And kind of a cool thing, um, all of the history of that negotiation back and forth is saved in here. So you can see Steve Masters proposed on this date and time, and it was agreed and approved on this particular date and time. As well as you can put in notes and say, hey, I really need Scott Bishop. Uh, you know, maybe he has a particular skill set, and I know that he has that skill set, or I've worked with him before, whatever it may be. You can put in notes and things in there. So it really helps to get a, a good communication going between a project manager and a resource manager to, to help to build this resource plan of how we're actually going to fulfill um, and accomplish this project. <clears throat> so that's a, a really great tool that you can use to do that. Once you have your resource plan built and approved, I'm going to go ahead and close out of this. Um, usually the next step then is to build your budget. <clears throat> so we have a tool here called the Cost Planner, and that's going to allow us to, to build our budget, as well as in the future it'll allow us to track things like actual costs and benefits and so on and so forth if, if you're doing all of that. But I'm going to hit Edit Costs here for my project, and it's going to open up our cost planner. And the very first thing that I can do um, that, that really helps make building this cost plan a lot easier is that I can pull in uh, the costs of my resources that I just put into my resource plan. Uh, so the way I do that is I'll hit Show Reference here, and I'll explain that a little bit more once, once we come up. But basically when I hit Show Reference, it's going to open a, a second window here. And you'll notice one of the tabs here, these are all of my different cost types. So I have different types of costs. I have budgets, I have actual costs, I can put in my benefits if I want. And this is all configurable. You can get your timesheet actual costs if you're, if you're using our timesheeting system. 
and that would be later on towards the execution process. We're still planning here, but I can switch to my resource plan costs, and now based on that approved resource plan that I put in, it took all of the hours that I'm asking for project managers and business analysts, and it calculated based on their rates per hour, it calculated a cost per month. So I automatically have my time phase cost here, and I don't have to go and do that calculation and try to figure out, well, the project manager charges at this amount, and the business analyst charges at this amount, and it just figures it all out for me, and then I can click on my labor row here, and then up in my budget here, I can select my labor row up here, and I'll hit copy, and it's going to copy in my resource plan costs, so I didn't have to go fill those out and type them all back in and so on and so forth. So it makes it really easy to bring those costs into my budget. <clears throat> as well as later on when you're doing your actual costs, you can copy your timesheet actuals into your labor row, into your actual costs here. Um, you know, so there's lots of different ways you can utilize that functionality as you're executing and, and planning your project. <clears throat> But now that we have our labor in, we can do things like say, well, there's other costs for my particular project. I'm going to need some equipment. Say I need $20,000 uh, of equipment in April, and I'm going to need in May possibly $25,000 of software. <clears throat> oh, I did $250. Um, you can see as I'm doing this, it's calculating over in the side here um, for CapEx and OpEx, capital expenses and operational expenses, it's calculating the totals and then it gives me a total total of all of it all together. And this is all configurable as well, so if you have different cost categories here, we can configure it to do that. Um, and if you even have different hierarchy, if you're not separating it out by CapEx and OpEx, this is all just how it is out of the box, you can change that structure as well and separate it however you need to, 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 as, you know, to be as granular as needed as well. <clears throat> So I'll go ahead and save that. Now I've created my budget for my particular project. <clears throat> and when I hit close, um, what it did was it took that total budget for my project and it pushed it out into the project item for me. So when I'm looking at all of my projects in a view um, to, to compare them to each other, I can quickly get an idea of what the budget is without having to open up that cost planner again. If I want to look into the details, um, and see that, then I can, but you can see here very easily my budget is 419960 If I want to get into the details, I can go look in reports or open up the cost planner again, and we'll look at some of those things later. Um, but, you know, very quickly at a glance, you'd be able to say, hey, is this a million dollar project or is this a ten thousand dollar project, right? That's kind of the, the goal of that. So now we have a cost plan, we have a resource plan. Um, but we're still not ready to, to, to you know, say, yeah, we want to do this project yet, because there's 10 other projects that we, you know, we might be working on, um, and we need to you know, weigh the pros and cons of the different projects to each other, and so there's some tools to help you do that. So I'm going to go ahead and switch back to portfolios here. <clears throat> And I'm going to go look at my whole portfolio of proposed projects, and then we have a few tools here, um, particularly that what we're going to look at is the resource analyzer, the cost analyzer, and the modeler. <clears throat> so I'm going to go back into projects. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> so what I can do with these tools is I can select more than one project. So I can say, you know, uh, all of these are my proposed projects, let's pretend. Um, I know I only have two projects in here, but so we can see some better data, I'm just going to select more. And so I have a, a set of proposed projects, or maybe I pick all of my projects for a specific portfolio, with however you, you want to do this. Um, you can choose whatever projects, and then you can start to do some analysis and some modeling with them. So I'm going to open up the resource analyzer here. Go ahead and choose that. And what it's going to do is it's going to open up all of those projects that I just selected and allow me to do some analysis and some what-if type scenarios uh, around the resourcing. So maybe we have some problems here, you know, I need this person on this project and this project, but they just don't have the time to do it. We need to try to figure out how we're going to resolve that so that we can actually do these projects, or we need to make the choice and say, you know what, we're not going to do all these projects, maybe we'll push this one out, maybe we'll, we'll just won't do this one altogether. So um, very easily when it comes up in the second window here, we can see where we have problems, where we have over allocations, and we can also see where we have under allocations. Um, so we, you know, we want to resolve both of those, really, because we want to make sure that people are working enough, but not too much. <clears throat> but, so if we wanted to resolve some of these over allocations, things we could do is we could come in, we can look at our projects, and we can say, well, this particular project maybe isn't quite as important as the other ones. What if I just don't do that altogether? 
And I could bring in extra fields here into the view like priority and prioritization score. So while I'm you know, coming up with these scenarios, I can be looking at that data and budget and you know, I can bring in whatever data I want into this view here. But maybe I feel like maybe we don't need to do this. I can uncheck it. And this is all what if. I'm not actually making any changes to any data in the system. I'm just saying what if we didn't do this project? Does that resolve some of our issues? Um, and it looks like it actually did. So that might be a, an option. Maybe we do need to do that project. I'll go ahead and reselect it, and it'll refresh here um, and, and show us that data. Maybe instead of not doing it all together, we just don't need to do it right now for whatever reason. We want to move it out, say, five months or six months. So I can click here. I can drag and drop. So I'm dragging over to the right, and I'm pushing this project out a few months. If we weren't doing negotiation, which was that resource approvals, you can actually publish these changes out since we are doing negotiation here. It's just notifying me that I won't be able to publish that. But I can still go make those changes after I'm done very easily by opening up the resource planner right from here. But uh, now it updated and it moved that project out a few months. And you can see now we, we didn't solve over all of our over allocations, but it, maybe it helped some. So we can start to play around with this and we can come up with a scenario. We can even go down to the assignment level if we wanted and say, well, this particular person is the, the problem. What if we just reassign this task to someone else? I can uncheck that and let it refresh. So I can really come in here and build a scenario or multiple scenarios to say, how are we going to you know, do these projects or which projects are we going to not do in order to still be within our, you know, resource limits. <clears throat> so it's a really great tool to help you do that. As well as, you know, once you actually start executing your project, you can come in and start comparing things to each other. So I can show my committed work, for instance, compared to my timesheet actuals. And it's going to show up in the same heat chart down here. It's going to show red if the timesheet actuals are more than the, you know, the actual kind of budgeted work, we'll call it so that you can start to do things like actuals versus you know, the, the, the budgets, so to say, is for resource hours and things like that to and do analysis and really see how we did and use that data to help make better decisions in the future, try to plan a little bit better. <clears throat> so lots of great things that you can do here within the resource analyzer. So I'll, um, also you can export this out to Excel and you could print this. You could, there's reports that I'll show you later. Then you can take, you could say create three scenarios, take three scenarios to a meeting and say here's our three scenarios. They're all, you know, possible options. Which one do we want to do? And we can, you know, talk about that and figure out which one's the best. So I'll go ahead and close this. <clears throat> So the, the next tool would be the cost analyzer, and to save time, I'm not going to go into that just because it's really exactly the same as the resource analyzer, except you're looking at costs instead of resources. So it looks exactly the same. You can, um, you know, deselect and select projects, so on and so forth. Um, and we have another tool here called the modeler, which I am going to open up. I'm going to select some projects here. <clears throat> And I'm going to open up our modeler. And the modeler is around costs as well, but costs are a little bit special. Um, so we built a special tool for that. So the difference between the modeler and the cost analyzer is the cost analyzer lets you compare, um, say, your budgets to your actual costs and things like that. Um, and, but in the modeler, the, the, the difference is that you can compare, say, your budgets to a target budget. So you can create what we call in here targets. And these targets don't just have to be budget targets. They could be an actual cost target. They could be a benefit target. They could be whatever you want. But basically, you hit create target here, and you fill in some numbers for the different months. And so uh, you know, a good use of a target, a good use case, would be my fiscal year 2012 budget for my entire company. You know, I could create that as a target. And then I can pull in all the projects that I'm expecting to do in that year. And what I'll do is I'll hit apply target down here in the bottom. <coughs> And you can create as many targets as you want. So you might have a, a approved budget, but a, a you know a, a estimated budget kind of a thing, or a, you know this is kind of what we want budget, a wish list budget, right? You could have different targets in here for each of those. But I'm just going to go ahead and select my 2012 budget target. I'll hit OK. <clears throat> And now it updates the second grid, and what it's going to do is it's going to compare the budget for all of these projects, as the way I set up my target, to the total budget for my company for this full year. <clears throat> and I can see where we have some overages, right? And I can see where we have some extra money sitting around, too. Um, but, you know, we need to fix this. We need to come up with a plan to, to be able to stay within this budget if, if this, you know, for this particular use case here. So things I can do very 
very similar to the resource analyzer or the cost analyzer is I can say, well, what if we just don't do this project at all? I can uncheck that project, and it'll refresh down here. <clears throat> What if I um, instead move a project out so I can stagger these a little bit better and say, well, what if we just don't do this right now? What if we move this out to 2014? Um, will that solve our issues here in the present time? And it will update and it will show me the difference. It's kind of cool because you have the little Gantt chart here, which makes it really easy to, to look at that and, and play around with this. <laughs> um, and so you can, you know, by moving projects around and saying we're going to do this one, we're not going to do this one, by switching through your different targets, um, you can come up with these models, and then you can export them to Excel, or you can print them, or you can save them, and then you could say take the the two or three of your, you know, best models that you put together to get the work done, um, take that to a meeting, discuss it with, uh, you know, whatever committee or team it might be, and come up with, you know, what we're going to do for the next year, right? Which projects and portfolios that we we, we want to go forward with. So it's a, a really great tool you can use to do that. So I'm going to go ahead and close this out here. <clears throat> So we looked at the resource analyzer, the cost analyzer, and the modeler, and those are all great tools to, to help with that. But now, um, you know, we really need to make a decision. <clears throat> we still haven't made this decision completely. We looked at all the different data, um, and there's a, some nice views to do that as well. <clears throat> we can switch here, for instance, to my project assessment view, which is a view I like. Um, which is going to show me, uh, you know, a lot of data, and all these views are configurable, so you can put whatever data in it you would like. But I can come in here and I can see things for my projects. You know, what's the plan benefit? What's the prioritization score? And I can look at all of these things together. And I could even switch if I wanted to to edit mode. <clears throat> And I can come through now and I can start to rank these projects if I haven't already started to do that earlier on in the, the stages. But I can say, you know, based on all this information, I think this one is number three. I think this one is actually not nine, it's ten. So I can start to put in some ranks here and figure out which ones are the most important, which ones we're going to do. Maybe I can use this information and compare it against all those models and things that I did. So, it, it, you know, it's definitely a lot of data, but it really helps you to bring it all together and help make that decision of, you know what, we're going to include this one, we're going to include this one, we're going to reject this one, and we're going to hold this one, right? So you don't want to just do that lightly. You know, there's a lot of work that you want to put into that to make sure that you're doing the right projects, you're, you know, putting the money in the right place, um, and that you're going to get the... the best amount of value out of those projects. <clears throat> so then I can save that and it'll reorganize and prioritize based on that. <clears throat> so, um, you know, that's really the, the selection process. We have another tool which is coming out very soon, which I, I can't show yet, but um, it's called the optimizer. And this, you know, this view here, it basically it kind of replaces this and allows you to pick different criteria a little bit more nicely within a, a, another tool. So you can pick things like, I only want to show projects that have an ROI higher than 10%, whatever it may be. You can pick some different pieces of criteria, and it updates and shows you the ones that best meet that, and then you can use that tool to really select the, the best product project items, and that will be coming out very soon, um, I believe, within the next few weeks. <clears throat> um, with that said, that, that's kind of the, the basis of the selection process. From there, you know, once it's included, you would go ahead and build out your project schedule, um, and then you would start actually tracking the work, and people would be statusing tasks and so on and so forth, and we don't have time to go into too much of that today. Um, but basically, um, you know, you would set it to started, you'd assign your project manager, if you remember our, our project page that we, we looked at when we originally created the project, we're going to fill in some more of that information, we might update the start dates and finish dates and so on and so forth now that we kind of know when it's going to happen, um, and then the project's ready to start executing. <clears throat> As it's executing, you can use those tools, like I said, to do some analysis, as well as there's lots of reporting. So I'm going to go ahead and switch to the, the reports page here. There's lots of reports during the execution and before, you know, during the planning stage as well that you can use to, to view this data and, and also export it out and print it out and take it to meetings or put it in PowerPoints or whatever you need to do. So a few different types of reports that we have is one, there's kind of quick status dashboards that, that allow you to manage your portfolio or your projects. <clears throat> so what I can do is I can come to one of my quick status dashboards here, for instance, my, one of my project dashboards. I can click on my project dashboard link here, and it's going to load up this project dashboard, and the, the, the goal of this is really for me to see some quick information about my project, see if there's any problems, um, and if there are, then I can drill in and figure out how we're going to fix those. Um, but I can see quick things here, you know, what's my budget versus my actual cost, budget by project, 
Um, if I'm not interested in all the projects, there's a filter web part here. I can say, well, I only care about active projects, or maybe I'm just looking at proposed projects right now. Let that refresh, and then it's going to show me just all the active projects. Maybe I'm only interested in this particular one right now. I can select that hit filter, and then it'll update all of my charts here based on that one particular project. So it really allows you know, a project manager to come and see the data they want to see very quickly um, and get an idea of what's going on. And of these dashboards, you can create as many of them as you want, and they're all completely configurable, so you can show whatever data you would like in here in any different way as well. There's lots of different chart types that you can use to show the data. <coughs> Another really great chart um, that I just want to show real quickly is the bubble chart. I'm going to load that up. The bubble chart allows you to, to see um, you know, things in a little bit different of a way. For instance, when this bubble chart loads here, I can see that the size of my bubbles is based on the budget. So I can see which you know, projects have the largest budget. Maybe I want to be a little bit more focused on those. And if I hover over it, I can see some details about the budgets and the plan benefit and so on. But maybe, you know, I'm not interested in budget right now. We're already in the execution part of the project. I'm more interested, say, in actual costs. And I want to see which projects have the, the biggest actual cost very quickly and easily. I can switch from budget here and compare that instead for actual costs. So it allows the, the user really to select the data that they want to see very easily. It's, it's very interactive with the you know, project manager or portfolio manager. When I hit apply, it'll refresh, and it's going to reload the data in here, but now you can see the chart updated, and the size of the bubbles are now based on actual costs instead of budget. And I can you know, change the diff you know, what makes the different colors and so on and so forth. I can really look at whatever data I want in this particular chart. So it's kind of a, a cool interactive way, as well as the filter web parts here too. So if I just want to show certain types of projects or certain things, um, I can do that. <clears throat> so that's a great way within the system to get a, a quick status of what's going on and to quickly look at data. Oops, I clicked on something here. <clears throat> um, another type of reports within the system are our SQL reporting services reports. And the difference with these reports is that they're exportable, printable things that you can send in an email um, or you could take to a meeting or put in a PowerPoint or whatever it may be. Um, so the, the different reports here today that we're going to show is we'll start with the resource ones. <clears throat> Um, we won't look at all of them, but you can see um, if you know, I expand these different sections here, there's lots of different reports, so we definitely don't have time to go through all of them, but I'll touch on some of the, the key ones, the ones that, that are you know, kind of the most useful and I like the best. <laughs> um, the first one here is the resource capacity heat map. I'm going to go ahead and launch this. The resource capacity heat map allows you to very easily see your resource capacity for a specific period of time. So I'm going to go ahead and say from January 2012, we'll just pick to say June. And then you can pick a department. So maybe you're the resource manager for a specific department. <clears throat> and maybe you know, I'm in charge of the project office. I can just view that if I wanted to. Or I can select all and see a total view of all of my resources across the enterprise. I'll go ahead and do that. I'll hit apply. It's going to go out into the system, and based on all that data that we put in using the resource planner, it's looking at all of that data, and it's showing it to me in a very nice, easily to look at way. It's showing me where I have some overages and some underages. Um, so I can see, for instance, Adam Barr is over in this particular month of June. I can expand and drill into that if I want and see what projects he's working on and how many hours, so on and so forth. So I can kind of get this you know, report looking the way I want it. Once I have it the way I want it, I can then hit Actions up in the top left, and I can export to a PDF or Excel or Word or you know, lots of different file types in here, as well as I can print this out. And kind of a cool feature that not a lot of people are aware of is you can also set what we call data alerts. So you can say, um, you know, if this person gets over 120 hours uh, at any time in any one of these cells, then notify me. Right? So that I know to come in here and look at the report instead of having to come in and look every day or whatever it may be. So that's kind of a, a cool feature you can use as well. So that's a, one report here, a, a, you know, a resourcing report. And we'll look at a few project reports too. Let's say, for instance, some, some cost reports. Maybe we're interest, interested in budget versus actual costs. So a report we could look at here is project budget versus actual costs. I'll go ahead and click that. All I need to do is select a project. I'm interested in the Xbox DVD project. I hit apply. <clears throat> And I can quickly see here, you know, my budget is this, and my actual costs are this, so I'm way under, though maybe that's a problem, or maybe that's a good thing, or maybe the project's just not, you know, finished yet, or whatever it may be. Um, but you can see the details down here if you want to see a, a little bit more, not the, the graphically, 
as well as if we really want to see the details and we really want to drill in, there's another cool report for, for at, um, looking at different types of costs, which is called Project Cost View by Project. So I'm going to go ahead and launch that. <clears throat> for this one, you pick a start and a finish period. So I'm going to say, for instance, through January um, to, I don't know, we'll say the end of the year to December. <clears throat> so we can look at a, a full year of the costs. The cool part here is you can pick different cost types. So if I just wanted to look at budgets, I could do that. If I wanted to compare budgets versus actual costs, which is what I want to do, I can select both of those. And then I'll choose my same project, Xbox DVD. I'll hit apply. And instead of looking at this as a kind of a total graphical way, I can look at this as just more the, the, the numbers and then drill into the level I need to. So here's my actual costs for 2012, and here's my budget for 2012. You can see it's the, the same data. We're just looking at it in a different way. But maybe I want to drill in and I want to see it by month. So which month did we spend the most or whatever it may be? So now I can see by month just by drilling in there what my budgets and my actual costs were and you know the comparison between the two. So we can see here very easily that the reason why my actual costs um, aren't near my budget is because we're not done yet. We, we never put in all of our actual costs for all of these months, or maybe we didn't have any. But then I can also drill in here and say, well, my budget as a total was this, but I want to see at a, a more detailed level, at the cost category level, I can drill in and say, you know, what were my capital and my, op, you know, operational expenses here. I can split it out as well as I can do that from actual costs. And I can drill one layer deeper in if I wanted to, and I could even see it at the, the actual cost category uh, level. So you can drill in or drill out and get it how you want it. And then the same thing here, you can export any of these reports. Um, or print them out or set alerts. <clears throat> so uh, lots of reports there, but I think those are kind of the highlights, especially as part of the, the portfolio management. There's bubble charts in here as well, just like the bubble chart we looked at earlier. We can look at different things, prioritization score versus budget, so on and so forth. Um, lots of different reports, and I definitely encourage you to, to get in and take a look at them. Um, but that, that's really the, you know, the, the tools that we provide at, at a high level of how to select the right projects, execute those projects and reports and, and, you know, and figure out what we're going to do and then once we do it, figure out how we're doing, right? So uh, it really allows you to walk through those 10 different steps. So I think that's it for me here. I'm going to turn it back over to Heather. <clears throat> and Thanks, there we Matt. go. No problem. Perfect. All right, guys. Thank you so much for joining us today. If you are interested in learning more about EPM Live, we welcome you to visit epmlive.com. Uh, from there, you can access trials, webinars. We have a lot of uh, free white papers on there, um, as well as some videos. If you have questions regarding today's webinar, please don't hesitate to reach out to me directly. Again, my contact information is listed on the screen. And then um, for those of you who need your PDU information, um, we will be sending that out along with the presentation and the video recording. So uh, with that, we will uh, wish you a good afternoon, and uh, hopefully we'll be speaking with you soon. Thanks, everyone.